Chapter 7, Selection and Development, Part 3. So let's assume that you've become, uh, you've gone through the application process that we talked about in that last presentation. Um, you're now offered a spot at, in the academy. Um, or, you know, not every police department has its own academy. Some police departments require that you go through academy training on your own. And so you have to find a uh, uh, police academy. In, and in Pennsylvania, we um, I used to work at Indiana University of Pennsylvania, and there was a municipal police academy there. Uh, I didn't have any involvement with it, but they provided the, the training for uh, applicants um, in their academy. And so many of those applicants were paying for it on their own. Some police departments paid them to go there, but uh, when those police departments didn't have their own academy, so for instance, if you want to work for the university or the state college police, they will send you there and I believe they'll pay for your academy training um, because they don't have their own academy. But many police officers or future police officers, police applicants, will pay for their own academy training. So it can be pretty expensive. Uh, so if the ideal thing is for you to go to a police department that either pays you to go to that academy or they have their own academy, like the Pennsylvania State Police, for instance, who have their academy in Hershey, Pennsylvania. So what kinds of academies do we see? Well, we have, as your book talks about, some paramilitary academies that are really, um, the reason I have stress here is that they are you know, physically and mentally uh, kind of like a boot camp. So there's, they have an element of stress built into them. There's no doubt about that. You want to become a Pennsylvania State Trooper? You know, the, every recruiter who comes into my class says the same thing. They say, you will spend some time in um, the sweetest place on earth, Hershey, Pennsylvania, unless you're a state trooper because at the academy, unless you're a state police cadet, because you are going to be, while everybody else is dreaming about chocolate in Hershey, you're going to be up at 0500 um, out there running five miles in the snow or the you know, or the heat or whatever it might be, you're going to be doing countless push-ups. You're going to have uh, your instructors hollering at you. They're going to be doing uh, checks of your bed and your locker area to see if it's clean. You're going to be spending, uh, you're going to be living there. So it's a live-in academy. You're going to be living at the, uh, the barracks. You're going to get paid while you're there, but you're going to be cleaning out the horse stalls. You're going to have, you know, every other weekend you're going to be on duty. So you may be cleaning horse stalls. You may be doing other kinds of you know, pretty um, nuts and bolts work that may not be very, uh, you know, not the stuff you were dreaming of when you said, I want to become a state trooper. Um, but that's what that academy is. And they don't make any secrets about it. They say, we are a paramilitary type organization. We observe a, you know, a command structure that is based on the military. And we're going to put you through an academy that simulates boot camp in many ways. And there's going to be academic training as well as physical training, but physical training is going to be a large part of it. And so you need to realize that if this is not what you want to do, then don't go into a paramilitary type organization. If you don't want to get up and run and do push-ups and pull-ups and box and do other kinds of self-defense and those kinds of things, then you may want to look from a different type, the second type of academy, which is more known as a civilian academy. So these academies tend to stress more of the book work. They usually don't have as any or very much of a physical requirement. Um, they're usually not live in, so you're not living at the academy. You're not in any kind of barracks or anything like that. You have your own apartment or you're you know, st staying with someone or whatever. You're not staying at the academy. So again, you need to look at and at the academies and say, can I stand this for six months, which is the typical length of an, of academy training? Can I really stand this for six months if you're in the paramilitary training? Um, or maybe you want to go to the civilian route instead. The instruction that typically occurs, you know, you're going to learn some skills. So that could be weapons training. That could be how to arrest someone. Um, how to conduct a traffic stop, 
how to do, you know, fingerprint, um, dusting, you know, whatever it may be. Um, you have a bunch of different skills training, um, policing strategies. So you may be learning about community policing, problem-oriented policing, you know, whatever kind of policing strategy that's being employed by your um, by your particular agency. You're certainly going to learn about the criminal law and criminal procedure. So when we have that criminal procedure chapter, you're going to get tons and tons more information about search and seizure and interrogation and arrest powers and all those kinds of things. You're going to get lots and lots of training in that. Um, you're also going to learn about the criminal law. You know, how do you interpret a statute? What's the meaning? When can you arrest a person for this particular crime? Or what is the offense that you can arrest them for? You're likely getting a at least or you should be getting some ethics and integrity training so more and more academies are incorporating more of this into their training because they don't want lawsuits later they want to teach you you know they don't want scandals they want to teach you um, how to handle situations someone offers you some money when you pull them over how do you handle that when they're trying to bribe you or you know you've got a a situation where this is your best friend that you pull over and do you they're they're drunk driving and do you give them a do you arrest them do you give them a warning and take them home I mean what do you do so we really need to incorporate more of this ethical um, training and integrity training into policing if we want our officers to be ethical and honest communication skills this is becoming more and more of a, a significant part of academy training um, policing is realizing with each year how we need to improve the communication skills of our police officers and you know this is also brought about by the fact that we do have more and more officers who have college degrees so even if college degree isn't absolutely required for policing nonetheless there are more and more applicants who do have college degrees so they already have some training in communications not just communicating with people on the streets but also writing if you don't think you're going to write stuff as a police officer, you are sad, you're going to be in, you're going to be sadly disappointed when you become a police officer. Talk to any police officer, and they'll tell you about the paperwork. You know, maybe it's more accurate to describe it as computer work now, but you're going to have to write up everything because you got to document it, and so you're going to spend a large part of your time writing, 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 documenting things. So. If you can, and, and we don't need you to be a mystery novel writer, we need you to be clear, accurate, concise. And so we need to train you to write better reports, um, to not leave important things out, to include the essential materials. But we also need to teach you good oral communications, even teaching you how to read body language, these kinds of things. So communication skills, you know, we often place them on the back burner and really emphasize weapons training and physical training um, but we're, we're learning you know, more and more how we need to improve communication skills in fact the Pennsylvania State Police recruiter was just telling me that when she went through uh, the Academy they weren't allowed to speak to any visitor if they were a cadet so unless they were given permission to speak they weren't allowed to now she said the cadets are actually encouraged to speak to everybody to at least say hello because they realized you know we're not creating good communicators if we tell them you're not allowed to communicate and so they want them to be more approachable to be willing to strike up a conversation because then maybe they'll do it on the streets as well physical training is still going to be a part of at least the paramilitary academies maybe not the civilian academies but at least the, the paramilitary academy on-the-job training so let's say you made it through the Academy you passed um, again mostly in the United States we're talking about maybe six months to go through the training in the Netherlands it's a minimum of two years of training before you become a police officer so other countries have much more onerous training requirements and to be honest with you those um, those countries tend to have fewer scandals fewer problems with excessive force those kinds of things not just because of the training but you know, there are other factors but certainly that long training plays a role and they really in the Netherlands for instance the Dutch really emphasize communications training and community policing and those kinds of things 
let's say you've made it through the academy, you're now on the job, most likely you're going to be assigned in your first few weeks, probably even months, you're going to be assigned to a field training officer. And so this may not be the same field training officer every day, but you're going to be paired up with an experienced officer so that you can learn you know, how things actually work on the streets. Hopefully it should be closely connected to your uh, academy training. So it shouldn't be that as your book notes that sometimes field training officers, FTOs will say, okay, now that you've learned everything in the academy, let me tell you how it really works. Okay, we hope that there's not that disconnect between the academy training and what's actually done on the streets. But these officers will help you. They should, you know, for instance, say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to pull over this person. I'm going to conduct a traffic stop. You watch me. And so that FTO does the traffic stop, you watch the FTO, and then the FTO will say, okay, you do the next traffic stop and I'll watch you. And then you can do some give and uh, take, you can talk about what happened, you can say, you know, understand what you did well, what you didn't do so well, how can you can improve it, those kinds of things. So that's what field training officers should really be doing. There's also continuing education. So we should have within our departments, we should have programs and classes. Um, these might be you know, just a one hour meeting to update you on changes in the law or in procedures in the department or other kinds of developments. But we can offer programs and classes internally within our department to really continue to educate officers about changes in the law, changes in policy, changes in procedures, changes in practices, whatever it might be. Special skills training, you know, the good police departments will often um, provide you, the bigger police departments, with special skills training. And um, so let me just back this up for a second. And so what I mean by this is maybe you want to, maybe you want to be part of the SWAT team, the tactical team. So they'll give you that training within the house. Maybe you want to become a motorcycle cop. And so that usually requires extensive training. I know I had Ocean City police officers, um, or actually um, um, Maryland uh, police officers, uh, come to my, uh, not Ocean City, but a, another county, uh, Montgomery County, Maryland, come to my uh, classes to recruit one time, and they were talking about motorcycle training, and they said it is one of the most difficult tests for their department. Uh, most of the instructors who are teaching the motorcycle classes failed the motorcycle test several times so again but if you want that special skills training maybe you want to become a detective those things can we train you in those things so the department may offer it i really encourage you if you're going to be a police officer try to scoop up as much of this training as possible um, if it's available take it uh, you it will never hurt you to have a bunch of different skills education assistance programs or incentives what we mean by this is the department may give money, funding, or time off to complete your bachelor's degree if you don't already have one, or maybe a master's degree, and maybe some other graduate degree, maybe even you know law school, professional degree. Uh, they may give you, may be willing to work with you to either give you time off so you can attend classes, give you a different shift, whatever it may be, or maybe they even give you, if you're lucky enough, give you money. Uh, assist you with paying for that advanced degree or even a bachelor's degree um, so that you are an even uh, better trained police officer um, and you know more likely to be promoted um, we see a lot of police departments that are requiring some kind of graduate degree for promotion it's not completely common but it is becoming more common that you're going to see that if you want to become a captain you're going to have to have a master's degree at least those kinds of things so maybe your department will help you to pay for that